Lisa, in relation to the methane emissions that you're um, quantifying from livestock, how do you account for the difference between um, feed li livestock and grass fed livestock in relation to emissions and the accountability of that? In all truth, I haven't done a feedlot farm plan yet, but there is a separate calculator for that. So have you, are you familiar with the different calculators to do your emission numbers, the GAF tool, so the Greenhouse Gas Emission Accounting? So I can send out some links um, with LLS today if you want, so you can have a look at them. Basically, with the feedlots um, for the methane, it'll be a lot about the, the feed additives that are coming in. Um, so it will be the freight of that feed that's coming in. Um, I guess also the quantity of that feed will impact, but also the weight gains. So all that's taken into account. Whereas grass-fed, there's a lot less inputs. You don't have so much in your grassland sort of environment, your, well, your rangelands, fertiliser use or anything like that. It's more based on that productivity of that um, animal. So in your beef herd, it would be your genetics and that type of thing. So a quick growth animal will have better emissions. Um, so it comes down to those sort of factors. Not sure if I answered that. Uh, sorry, so, no. Um, I believe that the emissions that um, are created from fe feedlot uh, sheep and cattle are very different to grass fed. Oh, absolutely. Definitely so, different so profiles. How yep. that, how's that accounted for in your... Because you're talking about um, supply and... So we yeah. do it on an individual farm basis for our farm plans, if that makes sense. Like, as an industry-wide thing, it's accounted for. But through our program and our project, we're really about educating farmers about what's happening on their farm. So we haven't actually undertaken a feedlot, so can't really comment there, but it would be the same as, like, an in any other intensive, so, say, a dairy systems that we have been doing those profiles. It's really about... The, the feed that goes into those animal and the efficiency of that feed then reflects back to um, their emission numbers. Um, and I guess with the dairy, it comes down to the milk that comes off farm. Feedlot would be the meat that comes off farm and that's where your emissions intensity is really important. Sometimes you'll find, even if it was more of a rangeland sort of entity farm, if they do do a containment feed or um, finish off stock with um, feed, sometimes the emission numbers do come up but usually you're getting that animal off quicker too, so that helps. So it's a bit of a balancing act. And I guess um, some of the feedback that we're getting from people, like if you're a better producer and you have really good pastures, it means you have more animal numbers, so it does mean that you have more emissions on farm. I think we've just got to be wary that we're, we're focusing on production and profitability too, but we want to make sure that we're doing the right things. But don't think that an emission number is bad that you're getting at the moment. It's just starting to collate those numbers over multiple years, so then at least you know your baseline. Um, it's Lisa, going... one of my observations about DPI is that it's a very large organisation with a lot of experts. Could I ask that you connect over lunch, swap details, and that you get her in touch with a feedlot expert as well? Yeah, to happy to. DPI there's, has a... there's key calculators for feedlots and there's key calculators for just sheep and beef. Yeah, so. and I think um, it's such a... No, I don't need that. I was just hoping to um, ascertain that your calculator is calculating the difference between grass-fed meat and livestock meat. Okay. I know, so... Because... Um, End of the day, it does. There's just different calculators for those two entities, if that helps. Yep. OK. Fantastic. And we had a question behind. Yeah, thanks, Julian. Uh, my question is to Lisa. Lisa, you mentioned that uh, consumers are looking for carbon neutral products. I'm just wondering whether you've actually um, got a percentage number there of Australian, uh, Australian consumers that are currently looking for those products, just to see how quickly this is coming at us. No numbers there. Um, I guess it's more appetite of what's happening in the industry and what we're hearing um, from that supply chain, from the farmers. Um, it's up to the farmer whether they want to go down that path and value add and brand their um, commodity off farm, so whether it's meat, sheep, like beef, sheep as well. Um, but I don't have any numbers, sorry. Two questions from the floor. Go for it. Thank you. Um, I'm wearing two hats today. One is Chair of Landcare New South Wales and the other as the Secretariat of the Global Eco-Labelling Network. On that capacity, I'm sitting on the textile review group of the EU Eco-Label, and that covers obviously commodities like cotton and wool. 
Those are due, the current scheme is due to lapse at the end of 25. Carbon is one of probably 40 criteria which we would need to meet to maintain market access. So we need to get a giddy up on a lot of baseline data, but I'd like to talk to you at lunch just about um, how Australia can maintain access to that market. China is also signalling potential adoption of those EU standards. So where are we going to sell our, our goods? Happy to connect you with someone in DPI that's reviewing that for Cotton too. Another question from the floor. Okay, one question that's um, a speed round of fast questions from the 16 that are loaded here. Is New South Wales part of the discussions around the development of the IFLM carbon method? Could it advantage New South Wales properties? Take it on notice. No, are voluntary no. carbon markets effective at addressing climate change? Sorry, I didn't hear that question, but the one before New South Wales in consulting on that, and my understanding is it's delayed at the moment. Okay. Okay. Um, is the DPI on-farm carbon assessment free of charge? Yes, it is. Fantastic. Out of the 16 carbon markets across the world, how effective is Australia's carbon market in addressing climate change? How long is a piece of string? I think there's a lot of drivers there, and I think what's really going to drive supply and demand, if you look at the ACU scheme, um, all these big emitters are going to have to, like, there's a safeguard mechanism and they've actually got to offset, and that's really going to drive up the market, and if there's not many ACUs in the market, well, prices will go up, so. And a final question for Jeff, because our session after lunch does involve finance and the banks. How did the bank hurdles resolve? How is that resolved? Is that how was it resolved, the bank hurdles? Uh, look, my answer to that was actually we had the um, the CEO of the bank and their national risk manager come and visit the farm only two or three weeks ago. Uh, so that they wanted to know what it looked like on the ground and how they could best um, work out a policy on how they manage that interest holder consent form and understand it better. And they want to do more as a bank to, um, to facilitate farmers taking on that. That, those projects. So um, that was how we resolved part of it. Um, but a lot of discussion and explaining what it meant on the ground and what it meant for our business, pretty much. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks. I guess just in terms of the effectiveness question, um, you know, we're still working out what's effective and what isn't, and comparing it is really challenging with, you know, different international markets. But I guess the most important thing you can do to drive effectiveness is what you're doing is coming along here today and learning about it and then feeding that back into government departments or feeding it back into what you're doing. Because really, ultimately, anything that we start, you know, as humans, generally the first time we do it, it's not as effective as the 10th or the 20th. And it's not as effective if there's one person participating compared to if there's thousands. And I guess the reason that I'm so passionate about, you know, landholders participating, landholder innovation, you know, really leading the space is because one of you participating will have one idea about what could be more effective, but thousands of you participating will have thousands of ideas about how this will be better and how we'll make the best markets and the best natural capital, you know, sector for ourselves. So the more of you participating, the more ideas, the more innovation, the more effective it's going to be. So when we ask about effective, we're the ones that are going to make it more effective. So, you know, get involved and learn more. Thank you, Megan. An incredible message for everyone as we head to lunch. Um, we're going to head for lunch now. It's 12.40 and we will return here and commence at 1.20. We do have a 40-minute finance panel when we get back um, and that panel involves two people actually joining us online. So we won't start late. We will just start and we um, will round everyone up from the lunch venue at 1.15. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your panel. And uh, we look forward to seeing you after lunch. Well done to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.